Good evening, Pepe Soto here. Welcome to our fourth session this year of the uh, Circle Foundation Book Club. We're going to be covering the book Bury Us Upside Down by uh, Richard General Don Shepard and Rick Newman. Before then, I'd like to introduce uh, the president of the foundation, Ms. Jonna Doolittle. Who over to you, ma'am? Okay, thanks so much. I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate your, your being here. A special thanks to Don Shepard and Rick Newman for bringing this wonderful book to us. And uh, an extra special thank you to Pepe for always making it happen. A uh, reminder on our part, our symposium on Vietnam is next month in Denver, September 15th through the 18th. It'll be at the Denver Hyatt Tech Center and a special presentation on Monday the 18th at Wings Over the Rockies. So we're hoping that um, there's still a few slots left. We're hoping that anybody here who'd like to join us would do it. And um, thank you all. I'll turn it over to you guys. Okay, I'll uh, introduce to uh, Rick Newman and General Shepard, uh, the authors of the book. So Rick, over to you first. Is Rick there? He's on mute. He's muted. Rick, unmute. As if I haven't been through that a thousand times. <laughs> Sorry for that, everybody. Um, that's just a familiar drill of COVID and post-COVID, I guess. So uh, we're going to talk about Barry's Upside Down, how it got started. Um, I will tell you how uh, we got going with the book, and uh, I'll be happy to step into the background uh, after that and let Don and uh, talk about the Misties. And I, I, I can see we have some other Misties here, and I think we'd be welcome for them to join in as well. So uh, this goes back to uh, the 1990s. This, the Barrius Upside Down came into existence for two reasons. The first is that Don Shepard is an inveterate storyteller. If you don't know Don, you will find that out uh, soon. And the second reason Barrius Up Upside Down came into existence is I got divorced. Um, so here's what happened. I was covering the Pentagon for U.S. News and World Report in the 1990s. I see Dave Deptula there. Dave, uh, you may not remember, but I... Uh, th I met you at the Pentagon when you were either in 05 or in 06, uh, working on one of the staff jobs there. So uh, it was interesting in the 90s. We didn't have wars. We had peacekeeping operations. Uh, and around uh, 1999, my wife told me she wanted a divorce. So uh, I basically moved out of my uh, my house to start the uh, new millennium. And I needed money. So I started asking around, who has uh, who has some freelance jobs I can do? Uh, in addition to my day job as, as a Pentagon correspondent, uh, there was a guy named Bob Dudney, who was the editor of Air Force magazine. Uh, I knew him. He said, well, I've got something for you, Rick. Uh, there's this group of, of uh, fighter pilots uh, who just, uh, they flew over Vietnam during the war, uh, and they just did a trip back to Vietnam. Uh, and they I think they have a really interesting story. How would you like to write that story for Air Force magazine? I said, sure. Uh, so he introduced me to Don Shepard. Uh, and I did write that story about the uh, trip that six Misties, Don and five others, took back to uh, Vietnam. I think that was in the year 2000, Don. Is that right? Don's muted, too, probably. So Don will unmute, and I'm just going to keep going. Uh, yeah, please answer. <laughs> so, so, as, so as I was just, that story was just, uh, you know, call it a 3,000-word magazine story, not about really what they did in Vietnam, but about their trip back to Vietnam and when I was working on that with Don, Don gave me, turned over to me, all these first person stories he had collected from uh, the Misty pilots and other people who were in the uh, unit over time. And I just looked at this stuff and I said, this is this is like you, uh, somebody, a writer could not get a better gift than to be given this raw material. Uh, I was interested in writing a book. This turned out to be the first book I wrote collaborating with Don. And when I saw when I just saw the 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 material that Don had collected and just the uh, just the amazing stories, um, I thought I can't believe somebody hasn't already put this in a book. Now Don was in the process of just putting the stories into a book, just as as an anthology of stories. But I went back to Don and I said, Don, uh, there is quite a story here. And what do you think about trying to do a mass market publication, create a full narrative of this unit? Um, and uh, find a way to tell this story for, for a broad audience. And uh, that's what we did. Don, you want to take it over? 
Yeah, I, I did. Thanks very much, Rick. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, there's a little more to the story than that. Uh, I thought Rick did a terrific job with the story and uh, talked to him and uh, said, and he said he was going to write a book. And uh, I said, well, the next time I'm in uh, New York on business, I'll drop by and let's have lunch and we'll talk about writing the book. I got there and talked to him and I started thinking about 10 minutes in the conversation. I said, you know what? This guy is a writer. I mean, he is a real writer. I've written some books, but this guy is a writer. Uh, he knows what the heck he's talking about, how to do it, how to publish it, how to work with an agent. I don't know any of that stuff. But I tell you, he's going to screw this up to a fairly well if he writes a book <laughs> without knowing what the Missy's talked about, the danger they faced, how they flew, all of that, all the stuff. So I, I want to get involved in this. So we decided we we're going to look for an agent. And so he tells me how to look for an agent. And we go and we interview this agent called Jane Distel. And uh, we came out and uh, he says, so what do you think? And I said, I think we ought to hire her. He said, we haven't even looked at anybody else. What are you talking about? I said, hey, she's a hard-bitten business, hard bitten businesswoman with a big office in the middle of, of uh, New York City. She's got to sell books. Let's just do it. So we were able to uh, sign a contract and get the, get an advance. And uh, Rick can talk later about how the business part of the business of, of a book works. But anyway, but it was a real pleasure to be able to tell the story. And the book that Rick is talking about that started us off is this book called Misty, which is uh, First Person Stories of the F-100 Misty Fast Facts in the Vietnam War, which is just an anthology of first person stories that I put together. And I can't tell you how hard that was to get old guys to write. And uh, and then, you know, you'd, you'd talk to them about it and you'd say, look, uh, I, I got to talk to you about this story. You can't say this. Why, why can't I say this? It's because you and I will both end up in jail if you if we publish it. Uh, and so the, the bottom line is you go back and forth 10 or 12 times on each story. We finally got them, the stories right. But I had to make sure that the stories were in the words of the storytellers, not my story. So it's a collection of first person stories. And that that's where the book started. But then as we got into the book, uh, it tells the real story of the Misty. And there's some other stories embedded in this Misty book, uh, the uh, uh, Various Upside Down. The title, the title, as you know, if you Various Upside Down, the old song, you know, when our flying days are over, when our flying days are past, we hope they'll bury us upside down so the world can kiss our ass. It's, a tricky title is really good. And then uh, some of the other things that I violated in writing is write what you know about. And uh, I knew about this and was happy to get into it. And Rick and I wrote every word in this book several times. We would break it up. We would write the thing. We'd pass it over to the other guy. We'd say, this is wrong. This is right. Uh, Rick, is, this is better. The only argument we had was about when the book started. And I said, Rick, you're giving the whole story away when you talk about Howard Williams being killed right away. You know, what are you doing? He says, no, no, you got to trust me. This this, this is right. And the, the thing about it is... Uh, that I've learned later in other books is that you've got to capture the people's attention on the first two or three or four pages, or they'll just throw the book away or just say it's BS. And Rick was absolutely right in the way that he, we got this thing arranged. So embedded in this book is not only the story of Misty's and the danger we face and what we did and the good and the bad and all that, but it's a story of the hopelessness of this entire war and the way it was conducted, in my opinion. In other words, uh, we basically conducted a war without a strategy. We conducted a war that was hampered by rules of engagement that just cost the fighter pilots their wives. From a MISTI standpoint, our area was Route Pack 1, the last Route Pack before uh, everything dumped into South Vietnam. And basically, we were basically tasked with stopping the flow of men and machine, machines that came in through Route Pack 1 because we couldn't stop it up north in Hanoi and Haifong, in Haifong uh, where we should have stopped it in, in the ports up there. In the transportation because we were afraid of spreading the war with Russia and China and what have you. It's the same old story. I thought we had learned something from Vietnam uh, because I came through, I grew up during World War II living with my grandparents and, and then uh, watched Korea, which was a tie. And then we got into Vietnam where we lost. And basically I thought we had learned something, but we just went through 30 years of war, repeating the same mistakes, getting to a war without a strategy, without defining exactly what victory would look like, and sacrificing our lives and treasure and, and what have you. So a lot of stories embedded in this, and a lot of them also are how we treated the families of the guys that uh, were flying over there. Uh, basically, if you read the Howard, Howard Williams story uh, and carefully, we knew within hours after Howard Williams was lost that he was dead. Is what... <clears throat> And I get emotional about this every time. Every time I say it, 
his wife was not <clears throat> his wife was not told for 24 years. Now, why was that, why did that happen? And the answer is because we had ground watch teams over there and interception teams of of, uh, of uh, communications, what have you, and we knew. So the first question she would ask is, Mona Lee, your husband is dead. How do you know? And of course, the answer was because of the word the the, the uh, watch teams that we had over there, but she wasn't told for 24 years. That's just wrong. We should have been able to find a way to tell them. And this was repeated, and you'll see some other stories in there when people were not treated correctly. My wife got, after after I Vietnam, I spent another year in active duty after Vietnam, got out and went with the airlines, which turned into a disaster. But my wife got heavily involved in uh, supporting uh, the, PO, the POWs are over there and blowing the whistle on it. And uh, she really got into a, a, a big argument with uh, uh, <clears throat> with a lot of people over pushing this. And basically, they were telling uh, we told the families, "Look, we're going to take care of it in the Air Force, in the government. Just be quiet." And of course, that didn't work. And my wife really got mad about this, and uh, she got into a big argument with Robin Oles and told him to just buzz off. She was going to go ahead anyway. So my wife uh, was never compliant. Uh, and still is not compliant after 61 years. So I'll stop here and let uh, people maybe ask some questions. They want to, I see a lot of Misty's honesty, General McPeak on here. And these people that are on know a lot about this as, as well as we do. Pepe, I'll back to you. Thanks, sir. First question I got is that uh, the book is the only one I've read that actually discusses how much of a battle it was between the strike aircraft and the AAA in North Vietnam. But we speak often of the air to air war, but the counter IADs were, well, the counter air defense war especially the campaign that Misty's uh, had against the AAA is large and documented until I read this book. Um, why do you think that is that historically we don't look at that that part of the war as intense as it was as it's put, put forth in your book? Well, it's a really important question that you ask about guns because IADS is a new term. We didn't know the term IADS back in an integrated air defense. We had people that shot at us and we bombed them and what have you. Our greatest threat, Misty, was because of our tactics that we had to use, and that's how we lost our airplanes. Basically, we had to fly at about 4,500 feet and keep our airspeed up around 400 knots, 4,500 feet to be able to see what we were after that was camouflaged on the ground. And then when we found it, we had to come back after we found it and basically direct strikes on it. Now, why, why couldn't the airplanes with bombs just attacking themselves? Because if you didn't do this day after day, you were not going to be able to find camouflage targets and you were not going to be able to have a, the endurance that you needed with bombs. So the idea was we would carry white phosphorus marking rockets and mark the targets for bomb laden fighters. Now, here's the deal. When you rolled in on a target, every gun in the area that was protecting that target was shooting at you. It wasn't barrage fire like was up in, in Route Pack 5 and 6. They had much more, uh, many more defenses up in Route Pack 5 and 6 than we encountered up there. Basically, they had, you know, you'd see two or three or maybe six SAMs in the air at one time. We didn't see anything of that sort done. In fact, we were able to keep SAMs out of Route Pack 1. Every time they tried to set one up, we seemed to find it and destroy it before they got it set up. So basically, the thing was, when you were down the chute, everything shooting was shooting at you. And that's that's why how we lost a lot of our airplanes because of the, the, the altitude we had to fly, which was 4,500 feet, was right in the sweet spot of the 37 millimeter gun, which was our biggest our biggest uh, uh, threat over there. They had ZPU, which is also a threat. We had 57 millimeter over the important targets yeah. like uh, some of the uh, the route crossings and that type of thing. But Macy, the 37 millimeter is what got most of us over there. So forget the IADs and intent. Let me tell you that there were 37 millimeter sites all over Route Pack 1 and North Vietnam. We did not attack gun sites just to attack gun sites we saw. When you saw gun sites, they were there to protect something. So you're looking for what they were protecting and then seeing if it was worth uh, risking the, the strike on the target or not. And, but we didn't attack gun sites just to attack them to kill them. That was, they had bigger guns and, and, and more bullets than we did. So again, the IADS is kind of a new term out there and, and the guns were 37 millimeter. That's what got us. And the tactics that we had to use were why, why we're in a high risk environment. We flew at fast, but at low altitude, we had 100, we found out later, we had 157 MISTIs out there and 44 MISTIs were shot down, 25, 28% loss rate. And again, uh, the reason was because of where we had to fly and why we had to do it. Back to you, Pepe. So as an intel officer, I uh, really, you know, enjoy the fact that you tell the story of the, uh, the squadron through the eyes of your intel officer. 
on the data ops of the way the Mystery Squadron worked. Um, how did you and Rick come to the idea to use the Intel officers, the, uh, the theme for how the, the ops of the squadron ran on a day-to-day -day basis? Don, let me open open on that one. So I see Roger Van Dyken here. I think he was one of the Intel officers and also John Haltigan, uh, who we focused on. One of the reasons that um, we focused on those guys in the book is because I met them. Um, so there was a lot of serendipity in the way this uh, in the way we ended up framing the book, um, we my, my reporting on this after uh, I did that first story for Air Force Magazine began when I went to one of the Misty reunions with Don, which a journalist doesn't ordinarily get to do. I mean, it's pretty hard, even if you show up, it's pretty hard to walk into any uh, group of um, vets from any any war ever and just say, hi, I'm a journalist. Does everybody want to tell me what happened? That, they usually they <laughs> say, no, no, we don't. Uh, but because Don provided entree, so what what was when was that reunion done? Two o two or o three, probably. Uh, I think it was o three or o four. I can't remember. Okay, so, it, so part of the serendipity is that whoever was at that reunion, which was the starting point for my reporting, which is how I got the you know how I formed the idea for how to structure this book. Um, that's how we ended up structuring the book, and that that affected the. Uh, time frame we used. I mean, we didn't tell the whole Misty story from start to finish. It went on after our story ends. And I, I think that's because we just felt there had to be a narrative that had to start in the beginning rather than an just an encyclopedic history uh, of the whole unit. But it, this goes back to uh, a, couple, a couple of guys who were there at that reunion and were willing to talk. Yeah. Uh, I want to add something else about the, the threat over there, Pepe. Another reason that we lost a lot of airplanes was for the length of the missions. We basically took off, and it was about uh, 20 minutes to get into North Vietnam. We descended to low-level Gwyn, and the intelligence officers were super, super important to us. They briefed us before the flight about everything that happened the next day, who went down, if we lost any uh, pilots down there, any pilots had not been recovered, and anything they had discovered from 7th Air Force or the reports of 7th Air Force the, the previous day. Our best intelligence came from miss these guys that had just gotten back on the ground or had just, just uh, landed the day before to say, you got to look at this, you got to go look at that down there. But again, the basically thing, our missions lasted from four to six and a half hours. We refueled either two or three times, depending upon the weather. And basically, we went back into North Vietnam three times. So it was a lot of exposure. And any time you were not over the mountains or the karst, you were being shot at. I mean, because of where we flew, you could hear the bam, bam, bam on the side of your airplanes. You'd, you'd be looking one way, looking for a target. You hear bam, 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 look out and hear the, the shells are going by on the other side of your head. So again, uh, basically the length of the missions uh, and, and where we flew and the tactics we use uh, were the reasons that we were, we had uh, such danger and such a high shoot down rate over there. And you talk about how- Intelligence um, officers, the intelligence officers are Altigan and uh, our first intelligence officer, Ray Bevavino was killed in a house fire uh, several years ago. So it's very, but Haltigan and Van Dyken were, were super, super intelligence officers. They really had us prepared before we took off, knew what we wanted to do, where to go. And then we got, got, got in the mix and came back and told them what we found. But to answer my next question ahead of time, sir, but uh, what was what, what was wing intel doing for you with the squadron level? Your squadron was a top secret squadron. If you had a wing function at the base, were they just useless or did not pass any intel from 7th Air Force and pack gaff down to you? Seemed now, like to your island almost. Now remember, the base had two missions. Basically, was was uh, missions to support uh, the ground troops in South Vietnam. And by the way, from an F one hundred standpoint, that was the most important thing we did in the war was support the ground troops in, in that were fighting in South Vietnam. Our mission for Misty was a separate mission. We had a separate building, and basically, we flew up and route back one. So we were totally separated. Although we were a detachment, four sixteen <coughs> squadron. Uh, of uh, of detachment one four six sixteen squadron of the wing there, but the wing wing did its own thing and what have you, and the wing commander was in charge of Misty and and what have you, but uh, we, we were kind of operated independently. Okay, we got a question from Seth Crofton. Seth, you want to ask your question? Yes, um, I had a chance to speak with Mark Barrent in Ohio in June of this year. And I was curious, when did the uh, night owls, the night program, start after the day program for the Misty Facts? Yeah, there's probably a night owl on somewhere, but I can't tell you exactly the day. But what happened after 
we had flown Misty for a long time. The F-4s were coming in and we went up and, re and uh, trained some F-4 pilots up there out of uh, Da Nang, I believe initially. And then later on, uh, the Wolfax and other people took over from Thailand after the bombing halts, were, uh, which we can talk about the bombing halts later. But after the bombing halts took place uh, and the Misties uh, were replaced at Phuket by F-4s and they moved down to Tuiwa. And then after the bombing halts, they operated the whole time in Laos. But after the after the bombing halts, even the Nadals and those other people uh, from the, with the other call signs took over in in F four airplanes out of Thailand. And you got a comment you want to make, uh, General Kane Raisin? Yeah, I'm not, not a question, but um, uh, sir, to you and to all the Misties on here, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for showing us what right looked like back then. Thank you for showing us courage, tenacity, audacity, innovation, and the spirit of attack that has continued all the way from you guys figured this out at 4,500 AGL um, running around 37 millimeters to today's F-16 guys and A-10 guys that are out there. You really, really set the example and gave us the gift of a good example. So just um, for those of us still in uniform, thank you. That's it. No question. Uh, Raisin, it's good to see you. I saw you here about a week ago and uh, thanks for what you're doing now uh, uh, for all of us over there. But uh, I got to tell you a little bit about the, uh, uh, about this uh, business of uh, when we came back from Vietnam, I knew it when I was there, the guys knew it when they were there. They knew it. They're picking off trucks one by one coming down the trail. And we ran an attack. We would lose an airplane. We'd lose a million dollar, multi million dollar airplane attacking a $20,000 truck because we didn't have what we needed to fly. We didn't have chaff. We didn't have flare. We didn't have raw that worked. We didn't have ECM pods. We didn't have precision. We didn't have stand up. A lot of us came back and we said, this is a bullshit way to fly to work. This is just terrible. And we basically fought for what we've got today. Now, you know, the guys like me were young officers and we we're just shooting our mouth off. People like General McPeak and the big generals basically went after what we really needed and got it and fought the wars through Congress and got stealth and all of that type of thing. So we don't lose airplanes today doing stupid things. We basically have everything we didn't have then, the ability to attack people at night, the ability to attack moving targets in all kinds of weather, standoff, uh, precision weapons to hit what you're after. All that stuff is because we did not have it. And that's the reason we lost our airplanes and people. It's just the, the evolution of war. Now, if we can figure out how to use it in a smart war, uh, if you can define a smart war for me, that, that'd, be a, that'd be a win for all of us. Got a question from Daryl Wickham. Jerry, you want to ask your question, Daryl? I'll ask it for him, I guess. He wants to know, how effective was the NVA camouflage in Royal Pack one on the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Uh, it was super, super effective. I mean, these guys knew how to camouflage. And, uh, you know, you would think uh, if you had big POL dep depots and 50 trucks or something of that sort that you couldn't camouflage something like that. They could camouflage something like that for sure. And we would sometimes be up there. In fact, some of the thing we lost people, we putting in a strike someplace and boom, the whole area blows apart. And I could tell you several stories about that, but uh there were guys, some guys were really good at Rutan or had really good eyes. Charlie Summers had really good eyes. And uh, some of the guys were just better at it than the rest of us. But uh, you, you look for unusual things. There was, you learn, when you're a fact, you learn a couple things real quickly, which is where not to look. You don't spend time looking for SAM sites on the top of Cars Peaks and that type of thing. You knew where to look. You knew where they had to be as you got experience over there. So basically, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, a, a thing of learning how to look. And the first five missions, you basically flew in the back seat or the front seat. And we tried in seats every other mission, by the way. We hated to, fly, hated to fly in the back seat, but you had to fly in the back seat to check out new guys. So after about five missions, you knew, how the, you knew the drill, you knew how to look, and then you got better and better at it as you went along. And some guys were just better than others. Along those lines, sir, um... I was surprised that the spit up was only five to ten flights to go combat ready. Was that really enough flights of guys, Gary, for combat for that kind of a mission? Especially guys who are doing their first time in combat. 
Well, I'll tell you, uh, a lot of the kids, as you saw in the book, if you look at the Misty book, a lot of the kids were first lieutenants and captains on their first tour. When I went over to Vietnam, I had I was an experienced, really experienced F-100 pilot. I'd had a four-year uh, a, a tour in, in uh, Germany. So I was really, really experienced, you know, from the standpoint of uh, most of the kids. Away. These young kids came right out of pilot training and came right into our squad. I was surprised at how well they did. And I, I just wondered... I saw Jim Williford on. He was one of the young kids in our squadron over there. And I'll tell you what, I, I was blown away by how good they were. And I wondered myself how I would have done coming right out of pilot train. I would have been as good as them. So, again, uh, you flew the first five missions being supervised. And then you could go into the front seat unsupervised. And I say unsupervised. You would have another pilot in the back seat. But uh, you, you quickly got on what you had to do. And the reason the front, we had two people in the airplane because it was a busy mission. The front seat pilot flew the airplane. The back seat pilot handled the maps, the maps and the radios and all that. You were just really busy. So, uh, and you, you hated to be in the back seat with all those maps. And you also had a big camera there you could take pictures of and stuff like that. And then they wanted us to to uh, take a look at some night tactics and they give us the army night vision things that weighed about 50 pounds and you get back there and bang your head against. It was absolutely miserable flying in the back seat. We had one guy, P.K. Robinson, if he's on, I think I can tell the story. He got sick every flight that he wasn't flying when he's riding in the back seat. That's how miserable. Because every eight to nine seconds, we would change direction because that's the time of flight with a 37 millimeter shell at the altitude we were flying. So it was just absolutely miserable flying. Uh, it was miserable for the length of time that you're up there. It was miserable for the guy in the back seat because he never knew what you exactly were going to do. And uh, and it's it's amazing that people still remain friends after all these years. You weren't you you weren't uh, you weren't always satisfied with the guy in the front seat. Let's put it that way. Well, how'd you maintain proficiency, sir, in both positions? Was that hard to do because you're flying sometimes in the front, sometimes in the back, with all the maps and cameras and stuff? Was it hard to be proficient in both the front seat and the back seat? I, I, catch I missed the point. The point of your question. Uh, your proficiency in the aircraft. No, no, you're, 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 positions. You flew. You flew every day, at, 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 almost every day, and you're either front seat or back seat. So you're flying an F-100, and you know, and so you were you were very proficient in whatever you were doing. It was it was not hard work. It was busy work. Okay, you you had to contact the flights. You had to contact the AB Triple C to get flights. You had to contact the flights. You had to join up with them. And then you had to find them. Then you had to mark the targets for them and, and do all the radio work, tell them the best uh, the best head, head out of the area and all of that type of thing. So it was just busy. It wasn't, wasn't hard. And, and everybody got proficient at it after just a handful of missions. Awesome. Uh, Phil, you got a question? You want to ask Phil? Muted. Unmute. Okay, I'll ask this for Phil. Um, what were you told prior to, to the flight regarding getting shot down? Where would you head? What was your plan? And what were your chances? That was Phil's question, General Shepard. Great question, and it depends is what it amounts to. Okay, here's, your, here's the, the first thing. Uh, I got hit on 14 missions over there of my, I, I got 58 missions. We got six guys, by the way, that got 100 missions, and I wanna say something about that toward the end here. But uh, basically, uh, I got hit on 14 missions. Sometimes you didn't even know it. You'd see a hole in the airplane, a hole in the stab stabilizer uh, on, uh, on post-flight. But uh, when you got tagged, there was no doubt that you got, by 37 millimeter, there's no doubt that you got tagged, or ZPU even, uh, uh, about it. So basically, your first thought was, get the hell away from what I just bombed and get the hell away from the guns. Now, if it depended on where you were. If you're over by Laos, away, maybe over the mountains, depending on how bad you were hit. In other words, you want to eject even over the karst because you're hit and hit bad, you're not even gonna, you know you're going down. Or you may want to head towards Thailand, that type of thing. But if you're over the if you're close to the water, the best thing was to get out over the water and get away from the shore as far as far from the shore as you could, because you could get picked up in the water out there, especially if you're a long ways, uh, if you're a long ways offshore. So the best first thing was <clears throat> Hit your afterburner, get altitude, so you've got a long time of flight. Ho hopefully, you'll, you can use your altitude to glide if, you, if, if your airplane is still in control. Get away from what you just were attacking, and then get to the water or get as far away from the target you just bombed as possible, and, and hopefully where the rescue forces get to you. 
Now, let me talk about what we did with rescues. Basically, our job with rescues was, remember, we're controlling, our job was to control the strikes. So we're putting in a mark, guy goes in, bombing the target, gets hit, injects. So now you're responsible to, number one, if you, at all possible, determine that he ejected, then find him on the ground, find where he went down, establish radio contact, and then and when you establish radio contact, find out if there's any bad guys in the area. If there's any bad guys in the area, keep them away as best you can with, with uh, your smoke rockets, with strafe, whatever you, you, you've got to do. And then call in the rescue forces, assuming that it's okay to bring in the rescue forces at that time. And it may or may not be, as a matter of fact, depending on where, you're, where you are. If you're right in the middle of a city, you want to stand by before you're bringing in the rescue forces. So basically then, when the rescue forces coming in, I'm talking about the, the, <clears throat> the Sandys and the Jolly Greens. When they come in, the Jolly Greens are very vulnerable when they have to when they have to hover to pick up a pilot on the ground. So basically, your job is to turn your on scene commander until they get there. You turn on scene command over to the Sandys and the Jolly Greens, and they do what they've got to do, and you stand by to help and it to straight for whatever you've got to uh, whatever you you can do at that point. So there's a division of labor, if you will, depending upon what happens there. The the heroes of the war, hands down, in my opinion. You talk about heroes, they're the Jolly Green pilots. I mean, I've seen those guys do things absolutely unbelievable. I, I bet I saw a guy hit a hundred times uh, uh, picking up a guy on the ground one time in the Oshel Valley, as a matter of fact, way down south. Amazing people. Wow. So you talk about getting hit. You guys got hit almost every time it flew. It sounds like in a book. How'd your maintenance maintain the aircraft when you're flying three or four goes a day and had a limited number of aircraft and you're flying almost daily? It must yeah. have been incredible for you to do that. Two aspects of that. Well, first of all, uh, we were using only F-100Fs, and so we had more F-100Fs than any other base had. Most bases might have one per squadron if you were lucky. And so in, as we were getting hit, uh, it depended on how seriously you were hit. And it's very simple. They were hard workers, and they worked around the clock as long as it took to get the airplane ready for the next launch. So, uh, And they do that every day today, everywhere around the world. So there's no magic. Our heroes out there... Uh, to make the Air Force work or, or, or our maintenance people, our enlisted people, if you will. They, they're amazing people that will do anything for you. They don't get any of the glory. The fighter pilots, as it should be, uh, get all the <laughs> glory, of course. But uh, the maintenance guys make it work, make it happen. Hold on, Scott, a question. Let me check what it is real quick. Up oh, just in here, Tignac was there. Uh, sir, the weather was always dog shit for you guys. It appeared in the book. You talked about the weather just constantly being lousy. Yeah. Is that just a matter of the weather, you when you're true there? Or was that just bad luck? There were scenes of weather uh, over there, and you have good weather and bad weather. You have summer and you have winter over there, just like you do here, but it's different than it is in the in the Western Hemisphere. But you have either the northeast or southwest monsoons. So if you have the southwest monsoons where the winds are coming in, lifting the moisture from the air over Laos and they go over the peaks in the western part, it's going to dump into North Vietnam. And so you got bad weather and you might bad weather on the uh, low level weather. And then you got rain and stuff in the North Vietnam on and then you got the the uh, the northeast monsoon. So you got one monsoon or the other going on about half of the year. And then the other half of the year is pretty good weather in both places. But when the weather was bad, if it was bad, our primary responsibility was Route Pack One. That's what we concentrated on. But if the weather was bad there, we went into Laos. And then if uh, uh, if the weather was bad, Louis, Laos, we went into North Vietnam. And, and there was no a good way to lose people or get yourself shot down was to play with the low weather, to go in underneath the weather. In other words, if you got a 2,500 foot ceilings, you're going to get tagged if you go in there. And if you, even if you don't get tagged, you can't put any strikes. So there's no sense in playing with bad weather. But we were way over there, and we, the weather would look bad, and then all of a sudden it would blink, break. One of our big uh, uh, truck attacks over there, Landing, uh, <clears throat> Landing Lancaster and I, just the weather broke, and we just had you know 50 trucks underneath us, which is something we didn't normally see. Uh, but uh, amazing. Let me, let me talk just a couple of things, too, about rules of engagement. We all know about the rules of engagements up north where you couldn't hit the SAM sites initially, and then you couldn't hit the airfields initially, and then it opened up later on, what have you. Basically, down south, uh, our rules of engagement were basically over flying. In other words, don't go below 4,000 feet. So we tried to pull off above 4,000 feet. We 
routinely has mm -hmm. missed these and violated that, uh, flying lower than that because we had to to see what we we're going to see. But we did not, we did not attack villages and stuff like that. We attacked trucks or material that we were after. We, but then when you look down there, you would see villages just totally destroyed. Uh, you can use your imagination on who did that. I think uh, the Navy had a lot to do with that, but they're shelling from offshore. But uh, basically, I can tell you, we were very careful about uh, ROE and angles of attack and trying not to hit uh, villages and stuff like that. So <clears throat> it was what it was. Hey, Daryl Wick, can we have a question, sir? Daryl? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, doing the fact role, uh, you had the opportunity to work all uh, types of assets. Uh, of course, the USAF assets over there, primarily F-4s, but later on A-7s. Uh, the F-100s, of course, at your time, and with the Navy guys coming in off the boats, uh, down below, you probably occasionally in Route Pack 1 saw the little Army cab units doing their thing. Uh, the Marine guys were there supporting us. Uh, any any thoughts on what your best strike assets were? Well, uh, yeah, I could piss off half the audience here by uh, picking out my my uh, my favorites. But on the other hand, Do it. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it, let me tell you this. It depended on the pilot. Uh, it depended on the pilots whether or not they could have. But remember, these are un th these are the days of un of uh, not precision weapons. So you could be the greatest fighter pilot in the world, and you didn't know the winds, and you didn't know uh, lots of things up there, and uh, and you got a couple three wingmen that are inexperienced and that type of thing. So it depended upon the guy delivering the weapons. Now, uh, everybody knows about the 105s and the, the experience of the 105s up in uh, North Vietnam. Those guys were pretty good bombers up there, uh, but uh, they were more experienced just because of the flow of pilots and what have you. And the, when the war took place, they were more experienced than uh, pilots and other airplanes. You had a lot of inexperienced pilots in the F-4. Let me tell you a couple of things that I've seen that happened up there that just uh, would just chill you. And that is uh, the old philosophy that a counter is a counter. I've seen people, we have seen people just dump bombs uh, rather than attack a target up there just to get a counter or dump them in the water just to get a counter up in North Vietnam. It didn't happen often, but it did happen up there. So, you know, again, you could pick, you could make a case of anything, but it really depended upon the pilot tactics use, the target available, whether or not you could strike. In those days, you were lucky to hit the targets you were after. I'll tell you, you were, you were really lucky and there were good bombers and bad bombers. And the guys that had the toughest targets were up in root pack uh, five and six up there. And they bombed the same targets day after day and often missed the targets up there because of the tactics they had to employ up there, the pod formations and stuff like that. So it was what it was. And again, the big thing that the big thing we didn't have was precision weapons in those days. So we got a bunch of guys attacking crappy targets and uh, had a great ability to miss the targets many of the times. Wow. So the thing about your book I found interesting was the fact that you really showed respect for the Viet Cong North Vietnamese uh, in your book as an adversary. Where did that respect come from? Was it your last visit there or was it uh, what you encountered during the war? I, I, I got a lot of respect during the war. Here I am flying a fast airplane. These guys are on the ground, you know, uh, living the, the crappy life of a, of a, an army dude down there on the ground. And hey, we're out there, uh, they're shooting at us, but I tell you, these guys are down there taking big bombs in and around their their uh, their sites. These were tough guys. And we we know, I mean, bringing the stuff down the trail, you had to admire the fact that, you know, this huge amounts of stuff are coming down the trail, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, just day after day, night after night. We didn't couldn't attack them at night at that time because uh, we didn't have the stuff that <laughs> came later. But these guys are moving and we can't find it. We can't see it. There's no dust. There's no nothing. And they bring it in and uh, we all know what they did. Uh, I mean, you just cannot have anything but respect. And then you got the natural respect for one guy shooting at another mm -hmm. guy that you have. I mean, soldiers against soldiers, airmen against airmen. That respect is just, is just there. So I don't care uh, who you are. I respect those guys. And we went back on our trip, the six of us over there, we went back in the areas. We, we talked to the people that we attacked. I'll just tell you a couple of quick stories. Like uh, we had to have, uh, when we went over there, and I'm watching the time here because I want to get in a couple of stories at the end here if people don't have questions. But uh, we had to have a minder. 
And so and this minder had to approve where we're going to go the next day. And so he went. To, uh, he was with us the whole time that we were over there. And he was a real pain in the ass. He was just a commie. And, uh, uh, you know, you can do this. You can't do this. And so we just kind of ignored him. One day we go around the, we go around the bend. And basically, there's some guys there, some uh, North Vietnamese guys trying to clean up unexploded ordnance out of a poor guy farmer's backyard. And so we stop, stop, stop. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. Stop, stop, stop. We tell the driver to stop. We go over and we take our pictures, helping these guys uh, with un unexploded ordnance, digging and, and what have you, and, and getting our pictures taken. This guy just goes ape shit. I'm gonna, you guys, I'm gonna cancel the rest of your. That night, he tried to sell us some POW bones. Jeez. So we knew we had him. We basically said, okay, uh, we're going to turn you in to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, to your local uh, Tommy friends over here and tell them what you're trying to do at man. So we had no more trouble going anywhere we wanted the rest of the time. Cause you know, we had him. And the other thing was we came around, we came around a corner and here's a school. And so we stopped to see the school. Of course, what happens when you stop at a school, the kids flood over and the kids all come over. And we had this one guy, Ed Reisinger that does magic tricks and he's showing the kids magic tricks and what have you, pulling stuff out of their ears. And so the principal comes over. The principal comes over. What the heck's going on here? Finds out that the principal, it was the coordinator of AAA in our particular area and shot at us uh, some of the time. So the kids sang their national anthem. We sang our national anthem when we leave. And of course, this guy that's our minder is just going absolutely crazy. But uh, he didn't do anything to us the rest of the time. So we're good. Another question I have, sir, is that the Missy is about a four-month tour for you in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, how how hard does it go back to your old unit or your main unit after having a MISTI tour? Uh, it wasn't hard at all. We all knew that the MISTI was four months or sixty missions because of the of the danger it was set up in. Now let me say something about that. Uh, there were actually four sections of the MISTI mission. Initial setup with Bud Day and the guys that we had no idea what we're doing, no idea how to survive, know how to do it, do anything. They basically set up uh, all of our mission profiles and taught us how to do it in the initial seat. And then we came in uh, in the second and third generations. I was in the third generation over there. And basically we knew how to do it and we we're getting some good results and what have you. And then President Johnson came in with some really good ideas, which he had a partial bombing halt in uh, 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 March of 68. And so all the stuff then that was defending up north moved down into Route Pack 1. And then he had a total bombing halt later in uh, later in uh, in uh, in November of '68. But it really got hot, and we had six guys that volunteered to fly uh, uh, 100 missions up there. And uh, I don't have their names right in front of me, but they're six really good guys, and they stayed because they thought it was important, and they stayed during the hottest time of the of the uh, of the defenses over there, if you will. So, but when we went back, so I finished my tour. Let's see, I came in October. Benoit, I, I flew a couple months there. Ben, no, I, I yeah, I came in October, flew a couple months, and then I volunteered for Misty. Went up to Misty, was through in April, and then came back to my unit and finished my tour in, in October of '68. So it wasn't hard at all. It was, it was a, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed flying down south. I enjoyed flying up north with the guys, and I enjoyed flying down south again. So no difficulty, no difficulty at all, Peppy. Phil has a question. Phil. Hey, sir, what so, was your appraisal? Yeah, what was your appraisal of the South Vietnamese Air Force? Did you have much contact with them? Did you control them? Did they go up into Route Pack One or not? Uh, no, they didn't go. Well, they, they did early in the war, but they didn't when we were there. And basically, uh, I tell you, uh, being in the South Vietnamese military, whether you're a pilot, whether you're a ground pounder down there, uh, was tough stuff. Um, uh, they were supporting their troops down. And, and let me back off just a second. When I got out, when I left Vietnam, uh, I had an assignment to 104s at Luke, and I probably would have stayed in the Air Force for a career if I had that, but I got switched to A-37s at Alex, uh, teaching uh, Vietnamese pilots how to fly. And I tell you, I look back on that, and here's these kids right off the backs of a water buffalo. Uh, they've been through language school, so their language ability is, you know, so-so and what have you. And we're teaching these guys how to drop uh, how to drop bombs and fire rockets and strafe, and then they go back home in the middle of a war. I mean, that's that, that's amazing. I I just uh, I still have 
utmost respect for those kids. <clears throat> and I wonder what happened to all of them. I made good friends with them. And I wonder if they got back or if they were killed in the war or what have you. But <clears throat> they, uh, I don't know how they were when we weren't, when we weren't flying with them, but uh, when they left, they had basic skills and they went back in the middle of a war and probably a lot of them perished is what it amounts to. So I would say they weren't very good, but they probably did the best they could in the circumstances. And then, and then we, uh, we left the whole deal and, and they paid for it. Okay. Um, Mr. Bingham has a question next, Mr. Bingham. Yes, uh, uh, yes. Uh, I'm curious if you have recommendations based on your experience as to what types of munitions uh, we ought to be thinking about. You talk precision, uh, but when you're going against vehicles and we understand uh, air defenses, uh, what do you think of things like scatterable mines that uh, uh, perhaps could uh, be used by interdiction? Well, I tell you what, I'm for anything that's standoff and anything that's high altitude that doesn't cause you to fly at low altitude that hits the target. I don't care what it is. And I'll tell you what, a lot of people out there are asking a lot of questions about drones and unmanned vehicles. I would have given thousands of dollars on several missions that I was on to have a drone doing this instead of me. I mean, I think that's just the way if we can do it, and do it uh, in a way that makes sense. It's uh, it's the way to go. So I'm for any kind of munition that works and hits the target that stand off and doesn't cause us to lose airplanes is what it amounts to. And I'm also for night and our night is our one of our big advantages that we have right now. So uh, can I follow up on that, Pepe? Yes, yes, go ahead. A question for Don or really for anybody who, who uh, who's a, who, uh, a flyer who would, who would like to address this. So think about what we're talking about here. We, we're starting, we're going back to the 1960s when we, it was the lowest possible, basically, ISR you could do in a, in a manned uh, platform, right? And then ISR went higher, uh, better, uh, better surveillance, satellites and everything. And now it's going low again, but it's going low with drones. So the, the question is, what do we know from the MISTI experience that is applicable to what we are seeing with the explosion of drones uh, in in the Ukraine war? There are probably a lot of smarter people on here that talk yeah, about I'm, that. I'm making that. I'm making that an open question. Yeah, how about Deptula? He's on there. <laughs> Zaytar, you can ask yeah, me. Yeah, um, uh, listen, this is... Uh, uh, I, about trying to gain the wisdom from the experiences of the Misties. So I, I'm not going to pontificate, but I certainly uh, agree with everything that Shep has said in the context of precision standoff. Um, area munitions are good in some cases. You know, we, we've we gotten to the point over the last 20 years, 30 years, that we've kind of gone to complete precision, but there are times and places where area munitions um, are highly effective. Uh, so we shouldn't dismiss um, uh, mines, aerial mines, uh, and innovative ways uh, to stop our ad adversaries. So um, interdiction should include the entire spectrum of capabilities, um, and we shouldn't hone in on, on just one particular alternative. Uh, but uh, back to you, Shep. Yeah, hey, uh, I, I won't comment any more on that, but uh, I do want to tell a couple of stories here, uh, watching the time and uh, being respectful of people and, and uh, leave the question. But um, we, we, most of the Misties now, we're reaching 80 years old or mid 80s and some of them older than that. Don Jones is our senior guy out there. I think he's 96 years old, totally with it. I had dinner with him here about a, a year ago and a uh, terrific guy. And he's a keeper of all of our photos up there. But uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, we're coming down to what may be our last Misty reunion. And we're going to have it at the uh, at the Reno uh, Air Races, the last of the Reno, Reno Air Races. They're coming to a close because there's uh, houses growing up in the area and insurance problems and stuff like that. So we're going to be there. There's about 100 of us going to be there. So it should be a good thing. But uh, they just took the last really meaningful Misty trip over there that I 
would have killed to be on, but I just couldn't do it physically. And basically what they did was they started off in uh, Thailand and they took a uh, up, trip up the Mekong uh, to Wang Prabang, and then they went over into Hanoi and Haiphong. On this trip, Guy Gruders, who was one of our POWs, um, I met Gruder, I knew Gruders at the academy and I, when I reported to Missy, he was going out to the airplane. I shook it, hey Guy, how you doing? I'll see, uh, buy you a beer when you get back. And I saw him five and a half years later. Uh, he was shot down, and he was shot down for his second time in three missions on this on this one uh, when he got captured. He took his family on the same trip, and he took them back to all the prisons he was in and the cells and explained to them what happened and showed them all of that. When he was shot down, when he was shot down and captured, uh, villagers came at him with machetes and, and intended to kill him, and a, a captain a North Vietnamese captain kept the guys away, kept the villagers away and basically bound him up and what have you, took him to his house and he and his wife fed him a meal that night. And then he went the next day with Lance Sajin uh, up to uh, North Vietnam and what have you. Anyway, uh, tremendous. He met the guy that captured him again on this trip and his wife and, and they took him to their house and fed him the same meal. <laughs> That's I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. Charlie Neal and Guy Gruders on when they were initially when Guy on his first shoot down, they went down of several hundred yards off the beach and were being shot at from the beach and what have you. And basically, the uh, 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 sampans came out toward them, and the some F fours attacked the sampans to keep them away, and they got rescued. What it amounts to. On this trip, they met some of the guys that came out after them on the sampans and had had lunch with them on the sampans. It was a good a good good meal together, and. Uh, then another important thing was uh, in 1968, we had an amazing rescue there. We had this place called the Disappearing River, where it appears that a river came out. It was west of Dong Hoi, just a river came out of this big rock and what have we called the Disappearing River. And basically, uh, we found out on this trip that it's actually an appearing river that comes out of the rock, not going into the rock. But anyway, this guy gets shot down on an F-105 uh, in the afternoon, and goes down right on top of the rock above the cave in the Disappearing River. I mean, he's right up the top. They tried to get him out that afternoon, too much gunfire couldn't, so they went back and they planned all night long, uh, basically, to attack the gun sites and get him out the next day. They did, they killed the gun sites, they got him out the next day, and he wrote an article, like Rick did, about the Misties, he wrote an article about where he hid some stuff up there, his, his ID card and what have you, his base, base card, what have you. His son read the article. He subsequently passed away. His son read the article and said, I want to go back there and I want to look and search for what my dad hid up there. And he took his own son with him, the guy's grandson, and they accompanied the guys on this trip. So the idea was that we're going to go up there and get a bunch of people and go up there and search for the stuff. I warned him. I said, hey, listen, this is not Disneyland that you're going to. This is a dangerous place over there. A lot of bad critters and a lot of unexploded ordnance. Don't think that you're going to go hoofing around and and have the freedom to search everywhere. <clears throat> they did not do that. They basically found the guy, though, that basically shot, saw his dad shot down, saw his parachute go down, saw where he hit, and there was a woman in the village basically that, that found the, the ejection seat up there. So basically the woman had vanished and what have you. I don't know if she died or what have you. But anyway, he decided it was not smart just to go hoofing up and when they didn't know exactly where things were and going to this dangerous area. But he met the guy that actually saw his dad shot down. He and his grandson did and made friends with him, what have you. So some amazing stories come out <coughs> come out of this uh, of this recent thing. And I, I would have killed to be on this thing. And then they, they went down to uh, they went down to Ho Chi Minh City and finished up. And then they went down to uh, New Zealand and cruised around New Zealand. And they went to Australia and cruised around and took a 30 day cruise home. So there's about a two month venture down there. And, and uh, uh, Dean Eckenberg that said that's on here uh, is uh, was one of the guys that arranged it too. So amazing guys and amazing. And I wish I could have finished out that way, but I, I couldn't make it. Daryl, what can we have one more question, Daryl? Uh, yeah, just a, an overarching question. Um, it, I throw out this out to the audience, but was air power the right weapon to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Were we really wasting our time with all that ground power that we had over there in Vietnam could very effectively have cut the trail? And of course, that proposal was made numerous times during the war. And the answer was always, no, it's a neutral country. We signed the treaty. We'll, we'll use air power there, but we won't use ground power. Well, it became more complicated than that, too. War is a political decision as well as a military decision, and it's up to the politicians what you do. 
And the idea was they were not going to put in, I mean, <clears throat> basically Westmoreland. And by the way, as a cadet at the Air Force Academy, I had lunch with Westmoreland on the uh, on the staff tower there uh, on an exchange visit up there and then met him again in Vietnam. But basically, uh, he asked uh, for 600,000, I think it was 600,000 troops, or maybe it was 600,000 we had. He asked for more troops to do exactly what you're talking about. He was denied by the politicians. So the politicians decided it wasn't worth it. And remember, the country was coming apart. The country was opposed to this war. Uh, we knew it when we were there. We watched stuff on TV. We didn't care. We just we did our job day after day. But uh, uh, <clears throat> you may have been right. You might have been able to do all sorts of things. You've been willing to go into a longer war and put more kids over there and get more people killed. We get 58,000 people killed. That was enough for the war we lost, in my opinion. So your book covers the POW day-to-day -day life uh, in detail. Why did you feel that was an important part of the Misty book to be talking about? Well, what those guys went through is was just, I mean, I, I cannot imagine what they went through. I think everybody that flew and is on this call basically wonders how they would have done uh, if they were a POW over there. I, I wonder about it. Uh, I've thought about it many, many times. And I got, we've got a group called the, the Friday pilots that we meet for every Friday for lunch in Tucson. And we had, we had six POWs, a couple of them have passed, uh, passed on, but basically they tell you, you do the same thing we did. You just do the best you can day after day, take what you can, give them, give them shit back, avoid getting punished to the point that you can't stand it and then do the best you can and hope the war is over and hope you're going to get rescued. And that's exactly what happened. I don't think there's any answer to that question other than ultimate respect for what they went through and glad I didn't have to go through it. Hey, uh, I think if General Peake's still on, he, he's thought about this war a lot more than most of us I have probably before and after. So I don't know if he's still on and could like to make some comments here. General uh, Peake, sir? Yes. You read me? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I see, sir. I was Misty 94. Uh, as Shep said, about 150 guys altogether. The bombing pause came along at about Misty 75. Yep. So half of the guys uh, flew their missions in Laos. They were quite a bit different than the missions in the pack. And, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, but we really don't have time to discuss it. I will say a couple of weapons school guys, OTE &E guys, came over towards the end of my tour with a new thing called Paveway. <laughs> 2,000 pound laser guided bombs. And I was just happy as hell to see these guys because we'd put them in late in the afternoon and, and really close the road. It was hard to, you know, roads are hard to close. So we'd, we'd, we'd pick a spot on the side of a cliff, put one of those munitions right on it, create a great big crater and uh, still it was repaired the next day, but I mean, that's a way to do this. We dropped more dumb bombs on Laos than we dropped in, G in Germany and Japan put together in World War II, and we never stopped traffic down that road, but we would today because we can operate at night and we can hit what we're aiming at. Well, I, I, I tell you, General, the kids today, oh, oh, you and the other generals that came back and, and fought the big battles. I mean, all the, all the rest of us kids could design the tactics once you got the, what we had from stealth all the way down to the night vision equipment and the targeting pods and all that. But just thanks for thanks uh, for what you got the kids for today is what I'm saying. Uh, I was kind of a minor league player there. Bill Creech got night capability. And I can't tell you, I was his planner at uh, his XP at Langley. I can't tell you how often he had to go fight fight off the green eye shade people. Uh, and and lantern wasn't much of a capability, but it got it opened the door. You know, and now we can do things at night that we simply couldn't do. Preach, by the way, as you know, Shep was our DO there at Fucat. Right. Uh, so he kind of understood what was going on with Misty. I took the, uh, I was the command, last commander at uh, Phuket and took the group, the squadron down to Tuiwa and got fired the first week <laughs> down there. Uh, 
but that's a different story. So I only got 98 sorties. So I still still angry about it because I was uh, doing the scheduling and I sure as hell was uh, going to get it out. Well, at any rate, I tell you, uh, if I got a message, if I have a concluding message, by the way, Pepe, you can go on as long as you want, but a concluding message, I would say do not fight a war in a dumbass mass, uh, way that we fought the Vietnam War, for sure. And yet, we should have learned that when we came out. But what do we do? Iraq, Afghanistan, same same type of thing. You know, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What's what what? What, what are we going to accomplish and how do we end this thing and what happens if it doesn't go well? I hope we're smarter than that uh, as we work the Ukraine problem and as we work uh, the China problem now. And I, with guys like Dave Deptula fighting for air power and the smart things, I, I think we probably are. But boy, I tell you, we've got some, we've got some tremendous challenges out there that we have to deal with right now. And none of, <clears throat> none of them are easy. <clears throat> I just hope that what we did gives people a... Uh, Gives, gives some people some pause about going to war without thinking it through and then the conduct of the war itself. So good luck to the nation. Yeah, that's my last question, sure, which was what do you want to end in the book? And I think your answer is you probably want to take away comments. Um, to close up, I think your book should be by every second lieutenant about to join the Air Force because the other companies, the overall capability of air power from uh, every part of it, aspect, intelligence, maintenance, weather, ABCCC, the strikers, the, the fast facts, the jollies. Your book tells how it all works together in concert to make the war happen and tampers and everything. So um, from an air perspective, I think your book is one of the few that really brings it all together and talks about every part. And it's always a positive discussion in your book about how important each part was to the MISTI mission. I think to me, that's one of the hallmarks of your book. Well, good. And thanks again to Rick Newman. It would not have happened without Rick uh, in, the, in this thing. So uh, he may not have been a, a soldier or a warrior, uh, but uh, he's a hell of a writer. So we thank Word him. warrior. <laughs> Word warrior, indeed. indeed. Hey, well, I have one note for uh, some of the historical people on here. Uh, so Don and I were just talking about this the other night. Uh, Don has a lot of uh, misty material in his personal possession. So do I. Uh, I got a lot of it from Don. We have um, a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the book, interview transcripts, unit histories, after action reports, uh, photographs. Um, this is sitting in boxes in two attics in Arizona and in New York. So if anybody can think of a better place for that, let us know and we'd like to get it there. I got an idea for you. Go ahead. Special, special collection section at the Air Force Academy. Yeah, I've tried that, but they've stopped collecting a lot of stuff there. But I'll contact them again and see if they might uh, they might want it. I don't know. I got another. Well, Jim, uh, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. I just got another another uh, overall uh, so what message for the group, and that is Rose and I went up to Phoenix today, and we're looking at uh, senior fa senior uh, facilities up there. So you come to a point in your life where you say, "What I'm going to do with the rest of my life," and you know you got to make some decisions, what have you. So we're in the at the point of that right now. But uh, I found out that uh, two things I can continue to do is one, I can continue to write books. Nobody will buy them, but I can continue to write books. And second, I can continue to fly gliders. You don't need you don't need a medical to fly gliders. So I write books and fly gliders, and I'm a happy man now. <laughs> well, Shep and uh, Rick, thanks so much for your book. It's uh, it's an amazing book. I love it. And uh, thanks so much for your time. And uh, it's been great to, to know you the last couple of days, and I hope you keep in touch. But uh, Thanks everybody else for dialing in tonight to send tonight's session. And uh, we'll get the author's name the next couple of weeks for our session in uh, October. Probably talk to Daryl Wickham, probably talk to you about that, Joe, for CSAR possibly. So we'll go from there. But thanks to everybody. And we're going to call tonight. And uh, Rick and um, uh, Joe Shepard will see you in the green room. Uh, good night, everybody. Have a good night. Take care.